Dear friends, I would like to introduce you another video series which is called Opus Corner Talks. In these videos I will be doing interviews with young talents, musicians who are already having bigger career or musicians who I simply find interesting. In this very first video, I will be talking with Dimitri Smirnov, a very, very talented young violinist who has won many, many prizes in prestigious competitions, performed with orchestras and recorded also two CDs. If you are interested in the whole video, whole interview, then like with the other series, the Opus Corner, I will be uploading the longer version of these talks to my website. So please go to www.benedekhorvat.com.
It's very nice to have you here in this little talk, first time. Thank you for coming. And um, uh, I know you as a very, very uh, talented and curious and, and uh, searching musician. And first I wanted to ask you about, actually about your last CD, which you did with the uh, Camera Orchestra Base and Heinz Holliger. And I know that you are um, always searching for new repertoire. And I, I, I just wanted to ask, what was the process creating this, this program actually about the CD? Uh, nice, nice that you asked that. Uh, you're asking that it's, um, yes. Like, I think, like every big project, it was sort of a compromise between how much of myself I can impose to this situation, uh, since there has been, well, we, it's a camera orchestra, camera orchestra Basel production, but it has been indeed a symphonic formation. We had three trombones and we had four horns and trumpets and uh, you know percussions and celesta and harp and so it was really like a big thing and finding that good compromise to remain familiar with the with this symphonic repertoire for the camera orchestra for for chamber orchestra also to respect the wishes of conductor to you know to to integrate into like 50 60 people crew uh, playing something uh, together. Uh, this is always, uh, always about a comp good compromise. There has been also, uh, like a strong wish about the repertoire. That was, uh, of course, mine. But uh, yeah. it was also wish of certain people who 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 liked who would like to support the project. Indeed, uh, uh, there was a very generous private Swiss uh, sponsor who, really made this CD possible and he basically really wanted uh, the French repertoire, specifically Lalo, yeah. since there was an uh, anniversary. I mean, for many of the violin players, Edward Lalo is a composer of one piece. It's a one piece composer. Every one piece composer, I mean, Stravinsky is not a du printemps composer. He composed thousands of other stuff, like uh, Mio didn't compose uh, Le Boeuf sur l'Etoile. It's also it's yeah. like a curse of these composers too. So there has been two pieces of Lalo that majority of musicians do not know and also maybe don't play often. We we wanted to to record them, and of course I'm a big admirer of you know complexities. And uh, I, I just included the other others, little historical hints on this uh, epoch. Yeah. Saint-Saëns and Duparc. Uh, later on, I, f I mean, even later after the CD was done and, pro and already out, I found more uh, links between those pieces. Uh, so how is this collection about, uh, I mean, Rims Rimsky-Korsakov collected no hundred or how, how many? Yes, it's the... Is it well, well known or how, how, how is it in, in, in... How do you go, go about this folk, folk culture in, in Russia, actually? I mean, this, because in, in, Hungary, in Hungary, this part, I mean, all this tradition, like collecting folk songs, and this is very strong and with Kodai, Kodai. and Baito Kodai and... Even, you see, it's even in Hungary that. it was a bit later, right? So yeah, Hungary, it's like beginning a, a of bit later. 20th century, e even end of 19th century. End of 19th century, beginning of 20th century. It's Rimsky-Korsakov. I honestly don't remember. The, there's a couple of other names much earlier than Rimsky-Korsakov that has been doing that, yeah. those researches. And um, in letters of Rimsky-Korsakov, you can find even names of those people who sang those melodies to him. Yeah. I think one of these... So there are recordings, actually, of this with uh, gramophone? Text. Or, uh, no, text. it's really no. only text. Okay. It's really only text and impressions, memories. So uh, the songs are notated. Songs are notated and songs are... So here I would say that it's uh, it's very controversial what, what we can find in those scores because Rimsky-Korsakov 
from what I understood, he was actually struggling quite a lot with how to notate. Yeah. But his yeah, goal was the easy. opposite of Bartox and Kodai's goal. He he didn't want he wanted to notate it so that people could read it and not. Ah, I see. So it was not the e- very exact notation of each of the ornaments and and things. Not really. It mm-hmm. was rather well structured and. Yeah. You know, it was very well behaved. Like in the sc- in the, when you re- when when you see the score when you see the hand, the score of of these little folk tunes, it's well done. It's it's well organized. It's rather square. Yeah. And I think there was uh, one in one of the memories he describes when he tried to notate. He was really struggling with the rhythm. And he, he, he doesn't hesitate. He really says the names of those people. Where did he meet them? And so on and so on. Most of them were present. Like present, uh, yeah. Roses, uh, yes. the, the, whole, the whole collection has been printed and probably sold in France. I don't remember right now which uh, publishing house. But it was uh, quite popular. But for example, do you sing these songs in, in, in Russia? Or do you, do you know about... I mean, if you like... Not a musician. Do you have any connection to these kind of folk songs or not? Not, uh, not really. Or did you know them when, when no, from your childhood, or did you no, meet them? Not really. Uh, I didn't really grow up in the countryside. I used to visit countrysides, yeah. my family and so on. I used to visit uh, and I used to see people who always live in the countryside. Of course, it's different. Yeah, yeah, culture. of course. I mean. My mom was a folk singer, so probably that's why I, I, I had the luck to meet these kind of songs in very early age. But otherwise, yeah, in the city, it's, it's a bit different. It's very different. Probably it has to do with the 20th century and this whole change. The culture code yeah. is, has been really modified quite brutally. And uh, people... You know, they as don't assimilate anymore with that epoch, rather with a later epoch. Yeah, the I connection is a bit cut for yes. sure. But you can find enormous material, enormous yeah. material, and uh, I, I can imagine. it's it exists still today. This you cannot really erase from from people need that. So you grew up in Saint Petersburg. Yes. Right. Your parents are musicians or singers. How did you singer? oh, like so yes, my mother yeah, is. A, she she is not. Well, she was. In, uh, yeah, she, she she was soprano in the choir. Yeah, but she didn't. I don't think she studied or. Sang but so f- music was kind of at home all the time, yeah. no, in a way. Yeah. And how how did you start violin, or did you start with violin actually? I start with violin. Because I I started with violin. Really? And then I switched to. I mean, I did parallel bows, but then I. Uh, I started with violin, but no, to with a bow. I just had a violin. Just, really? so just, only, yes. Then you studied in, in St. Petersburg. In the yes. very... My primary education was St. Petersburg, yeah. violin, 10 yeah. years of violin, more. And great teacher. I had a really soft teacher. I didn't have so called Russian teacher. I, my teacher was very, very nice. To me. Few of her students are today on the scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for example? Island Pritchen is her student. He's a fantastic violinist. Uh, Ev- uh, Evgeny Svirilov is the guy who is a fantastic baroque violinist, also modern violinist. He's in Concerto Köln. Yeah. He's the leader, or one of the leaders, I'm not so sure. And he has his own group, baroque group. And then I had, it, yes, and then my first teacher, that lady, she, she had the cancer, she had pancreas cancer, so she died at the age of 66. I was, by then, I was 15. And then I finished my school there. I had changed many teachers there. I, I tried with many people, wonderful people. And then somehow I didn't find... I didn't find my own, yeah, yeah, you know, I didn't find a way yet. Then later on, I, I got into a class of Pavel Vernikov, uh, which was very, very different. Uh, it was a little bit more about, 
yes in a way business yeah. like competitions and so on and you know instruments but with him I had the more maybe the most um, emotional relationships uh-huh. it's love and hate so we didn't finish really well but of course I, I learned from him enormous things and I admire him as a violinist yeah. he, I was always crying when he played he didn't play often on stage but when he was on stage he played so in the moment he was given everything is it a very very important attribute of the teacher that you saw him or her playing or a good teacher can be also without i mean like explaining things with words but showing a less it's a it's a important questions i don't have what a, are the good qualities for you as a of teacher? A good teacher yeah of a teacher. certainly it's uh it at certain stage of a student a certain age it maybe it matters when you see your mentor at work like not only explaining you but also doing it what you what what yeah yeah, what you have to do it's important to see it it's an example it's uh, well when it's too much it maybe can confuse also when it's too easy so you have to see with the with a different student you have to really see what you can do what you cannot do because when the student is really struggling and then you take a violin and everything works because maybe you know the passage or maybe you just, I don't know, it's e- just easier for you to do it than for the student. Then it can confuse. A kid can go like, oh, but I will never yeah, do that. Do. And in the end, it's always, uh, I see in situations in the classes that students admire their teachers. They overvalue value their teachers. So you need some kind of filter, no? Yes, you need to, you have to also like make it clear for a student that it's just an exchange between two musicians. The age doesn't matter. Today, plenty of teachers are just above 20. Like, before it was not possible. Do you also teach yourself? Mm, I Sometimes I listen to chamber music groups. Sometimes friends ask me to tell them what... Do, what do I think about how they play chamber mm. chamber music and I enjoy really just saying you know uh, something opinion, yes yeah, opinion maybe how to you know how to work less and get more uh, result that's also very important today we you know we are so focused on our techniques and then before we just we overwork and the result is not as strong mm. as you think it is when you think oh, I'm working so hard and I, I have spent so many hours and then it should be impressive because in the end it's entertaining. So if you are, if you let someone impressed, touched, you know, uh, you know, goosebumps all around the skin, then maybe you did a great, great job. But it's not always the result of how hard you work. It's more often maybe a result of what you want to deliver. That's why we like so much fo- uh, folk music and folk singers and folk musicians. Okay. Street musicians here in Basel are m- incredible. The accordion player at at the, at the they don't main care station. about certain things which we might care t- way too much. Yes, we, <laughs> it's, <laughs> maybe we it's overestimate even certain aspects of performing totally. or playing music. Totally. That's, that's totally. for sure. Which they are not even aware of. They just do it because they 
they love used to, to do, do it. Yeah. They, yeah. They, so in, in Rainer's class, is, was it very different than when you... When, you when I entered Rainer's class, Rainer Schmidt's class, yes, it was fundamentally different approach to music. This is, I relate more to the personalities. My, my, my first teacher in Europe was Pavel, extravagant, extrovert, if, yeah. you know, very bright and, you know, like an, like an actor. You mean, yeah, I mean, like, you know, you are impressed. And when I entered Rainer's class, it was very different approach to what, how to read the score, how to actually just see yourself on stage in, in a little bit. It was very different. Uh, and of course, uh, basically, both were about listening. Yeah. Maybe how to listen, what is important. For me, I think both were effective in different ways. It's kind of looking inside and looking, looking a bit inside. outside. So you had both words, like. I think with Reiner, I I I, I uh, had the possibility to actually search, search more. S appreciate the search in a different yeah. way, you know. Yeah. And be fascinated by very simple things and actually accept the fact that simple things are wonderful too we always we are so focused on how difficult our instrument is so if we do more and we think okay so we have to do more and it will be effective or it will be appreciated and in fact when it comes about simplicity we we don't know what to do and that's uh, where change happen so this approach was the most influential for you how do you look at music and how you... I think it's just, it's in a way, curve. this, my little educational circle yeah. was kind of closed because... Yeah. So, and then, of course, then it's possible to, 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 to go over it and to discover more things. But, you know, in the Rhinus class, we always speak about physical aspect of what we do. You know, the breath... So it's, it's, it's a very conscious search? Very much. It's kind of a, I don't know how to explain. It's very global. Like we we don't really, um, we we don't try to impress ourselves with how music is wonderful. Of course, it is wonderful, but what why it works? What makes music feel? What we feel? Why? Uh, w uh, where does it belong to? Uh, you know, magic why this is magical and this is not, you know? And then you kind of just actually analyze it. It's very, very interesting. Like, um, Reiner never stopped repeating about tension and release in every aspect, you know, physical also. Yeah. When, when you, you know, have to pull your string and then you, you know, you, you transform your sound by releasing this, the ball pressure and then the, the sound is transforming and then something is changing and then you, you get... Uh, to listen some something it was one thing and then it became other thing yeah. and uh, this like pay attention to to all these little things so this is a part where, where, where you prepare but when you on stage do you do you think about these things or how is it is it like it depends on stage i think no it's a totally it's a different I, and state. on stage it's a little on, on, well, on stage, uh, you have... Uh, is it more intuitive on stage? Um, sometimes. In a good situation, yes. It, it, ideally, you have to be Ide reacting to what yeah. happenings, what is happening. Sometimes when it's well prepared, it happens. Uh, even sometimes when things are not yet... At it's, yeah, at its best, I don't know how to say when you think it's not yet there, it's not yet what you want to, to, to do with the material. Sometimes also in these situations you can you can catch this liberty and you know just like right. yeah relax yeah. and and uh, like you don't have to fight with yourself or fight with a struggle or fight with a stress or with a room acoustic. Just kind of find new approach all the time 
it's uh, crucial. Of course, you have to relate to something you you have been working on, and also when you know your instrument very well. We are also lucky. We have always our instrument with us, not like you guys with piano. You know, always have to see you. Or unless, instruments. unless you are under a shift. Unless you are, some <laughs> yes, artists that bring. You can bring your but f f we are, we have no excuses, right? So we have to really, and it's also fun to, to, to try. For example, now I came here, I don't know your room, and I wanted to play these little Swiss pieces. So you did quite any competition in your life, or it's? I didn't do a lot. I had uh, maybe around ten. Mm. I started at the age of ten, and I started quite good. Maybe you can say. So I was. I didn't have a very very dra traumatic experience at the very first competition. Yeah. Uh, not that I really remember anything about it, that I really don't. And then somehow the second one, the third one was, I think first three were quite okay. Uh, I learned a lot. Then it started to you be a little bit... You the proce process preparing the program a lot? Stress. Yeah. Stress, I think. Preparing... Are, are you nervous? 
no. mean, not in a not in a competition sense, just in the general performance sense before you go on stage. Or how is it for no, you? I learned to transform this into excitement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But with the with the routine, or did you did you switch something in your brain, or it was just a natural process of changing into this? It, it was a natural uh, something organic that happened, yeah. but it was also you know you have to always motivate yourself to 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 feel this way. I think yeah. it's mo- of course you use, there is stress. Yes. Sometimes there is more. Sometimes there is that, but just always remember that this is job that doesn't hurt anyone. That's maybe the most what I would keep telling to people like I don't know to colleagues or whatever who are struggling of course I know that some people are so stressed and they uh, it's better not to even speak about it for some people they they really um, have different uh, you know different understanding of stress and stage and when I try to speak to colleagues who are very stressed and say like look there is really not so much that can happen. You know, you are not a uh, pilot of civil aviation. You you are not going to kill anyone with it. Maximum, hopefully hopefully not. (laughs) I saw sometimes people having heart attacks on the concert, but this is, it's not your fault in a way. If if you think that might cause some deaths. No, no, it does not really do that. And that's the first, the, first reason to just take your job is well we it's a privilege to have that job i mean we have almost zero responsibility in this uh, regard in this regard otherwise then of course when, when it comes to the audience and what you want to do that how audience is important how your performance is important then you have to find out what's the primer thing and then maybe work on your stress yeah. 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 Because nobody wants to see a stressful person on stage. That yes. it's not in not in anyone's interest to see us, to see something. Maybe it's if it's a part of music, maybe it's if you play just to call which 11th symphony second movement then maybe there is uh, well, maybe that's not the best example but there is music that you require that otherwise uh, no stress is how you yeah how you if you if you're able to transform your stress into something that really helps i transform it into excitement of an event Uh, like what's gonna happen it's the uh, you know when you go to cinema or a theater or when you go to play football what's gonna happen you don't know that's the best who's gonna lose this or this who's gonna uh, win like this is the essence of stage what's going to happen so this curiosity also um forms or shape your repertoire choice because you are playing i mean from baroque even to um, contemporary everything and how how you are just curious to discover new things which you have never heard or never never played Absolutely. or is it sometimes you just get inspired from something and then you try to search around it or how is it i i feel like shell combs oh, let's find this yeah. lost lost manuscripts and of course i so fail I, like... I i i i i don't have I never studied, you know, like musicology. I don't, you know, it's really an amateur approach. I go to library, I open a catalog, or I read about an instrument, and I've discovered that that instrument was sold by this musician to that musician. And And then then I tried to check, and then I found out that these people, you know, had also their lives, and then they did something interesting. They, it just happened that they, their work did not last longer than the other guys or but girls or whatever. Not discovered early not, value. Yeah, 
<laughs> yes, or, or, or well, other people. And yeah. I, of course, you know, everyone should maybe deserve. just try and also des deserve to, yeah. to, to, to be discovered. Um, and it's, and of course, endless. What is certain about the past is that it's almost mythological because you don't know what was. So you can actually, uh, you know, you're much more free to, to interpret in a way. In a way, I mean, it depends how far you go. But it no, depends I mean, how far you go. Because actually, I, I mean, I was I was checking. I mean, I was listening to your your CD and this new CD, and then I went on finding some old recordings by Sarasota himself, yeah. which it's very very fascinating how he was imagining his. I mean, how he was playing his own pieces, and I had the feeling that it's actually quite a different approach what they might want here today. Of course. Yeah. I mean, certainly. But what should I do we is not should we stick to, I mean, Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, this is always a question. I mean, this should yeah. we take into consideration, or because, for example, if you listen to Bartok recordings, it's very often the case that even though he was very accurately writing all these tempo things and everything, but he always, almost always, plays the pieces faster as it notated so which one do you take into more into consideration the written text or if you have any kind of audio audible text audible things i know there are two opinions or in general don't touch don't modify i recently spoke to people to musicians wonderful musicians and we discussed Bartok, actually, yeah. and how free you are. We were discussing uh, Pekka Kusisto Bartok Divertimento performance, where he improvised the cadenza. Mm. If you listen to what he is doing, he's taking a passage and he's putting it in different octaves. Yeah. So, of course, it sounds like improvisation. There is a fermata written on top. Yeah. Okay, one can say, yeah, there is fermata, so you can improvise. And why not say, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not 18th century music. Fermata doesn't mean anymore that you can actually do whatever you want. But who said that? In a, in a way, it's right, because people don't do it anymore. Or why they stop doing it? Why they did it at the first place? So it's really like an opinion. But in case of this Pekka Kursisto recording performance, it was recorded live. It works. It sounds wonderful. It sounds amazing. It sounds so cool. So why not? They, yes, he didn't respect the, sc the score. But when you think the score is, there is limits also. But when you are a composer, you take your piece of paper. Yes, of what do you want to express? They, there's so many. I mean, but it also makes a difference if it was a live recording or if it was a CD recording, no? I mean. I'm pretty sure Pekagus still wouldn't mind to, 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 to just go in the studio and record like this. Yeah, to keep that take in the studio recording. Maybe I have this impression, but maybe I'm totally wrong. I have the same I, I did it this I did the same thing in Bartok Solo Sonata. In the third movement. I did absolutely the same. I kind of respected that that the timing yeah. indicated by Bartok's hand. Also the question how he did this timing. Was, was he doing that from Menuhin's playing, when Yaguni Menuhin played for him? Did, did he do it afterwards? Or he calculated the tempo and then amount of bars and so on and so on with all those written notes, uh, yeah. written. And there are also fermatas written. So I did it just because I wanted to try. And I didn't do like improvisation. I just took other pieces of Bartok and kind of included it in this little spot when you could add something else yeah. well it's yeah and in the end you know if it works out or not it's not up to yeah, the performer to, to, to decide if yeah, that was yeah. it's if it lasts if also it's not about if it lasts or not if it if someone is touched or if someone raised certain questions of, after listening to music or watching a painting or whatever then maybe it, it found yes yeah. it, it, if, if someone is provoked in some ways th here is th here would be a nice thing to discuss uh, to what degree you can provoke you know and what's the result of your provocation 
you know yeah. this is uh, but this is I cannot really speak about that I don't know I don't have enough understanding so I, I, I read somewhere that you when uh, devising your program and project uh, you like to take human uh. and political <laughs> <laughs> context into consideration what does what does that mean to you yeah maybe that's very strong statement okay. i sounds very and strong political yeah well perhaps maybe it was about like you know the spotlight is always on one thing you know and there is other thing around so like don't miss out like think about both uh -huh. you know the way we know the past because we deal with the past half of our time half of our time classical musicians they deal with the past they deal with today maybe like 20 percent of their work and what when we deal with things that uh, are broader than they are yes and uh, when choosing something i cannot help but i really want to see the other side and here maybe when politics come to play yeah. comes in comes because in yeah. it's political very often okay so like, the, this kind of view does have an influence on your choose of your repertoire no? in a way yes in a way i just have to i, I just see it you know when i see uh, when one of the composers of Les Six uh, is a communist and no one is playing him. Okay, good, perfect. Was he a bad composer? Was he a bad person? Pfft. Why? Just because he liked the uh, bit crazier ideas? Mm. Yeah. For me, that doesn't really... Yeah. I, I'm speaking about this Louis Dure I found last year about him. This I really cannot understand. I, I can understand actually. Like for example, Paul Zacher Stephen doesn't have communist composers. Yeah. I'm not communist. I, I'm not. Uh, you know, it's, I'm not the one who would be like now turning into like a red flag and saying, yeah. <laughs> no, of course not. But it's funny. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Do you? go back to to, to Russia. Russia sometimes do you, do you play there nowadays or no, how is it? I, I, I had to cancel some things I had to had to because of it would create for many people many it would maybe cause troubles to other people concert organizers and so on in your in here in, in Switzerland, here in Switzerland since went really fast and people Many people reacted emotionally. It's clear. Yeah. I also did. And I understand when it was too emotional. I was lucky not to have any uh, major conflicts with anyone based on this ethnic, political, yeah. whatever yeah. problem that occurred. But I was really uh, aware of the fact that it could just be, I, you know, it was just directly after Ayave. So I got some uh, yeah. engagement in Moscow and St. Petersburg and Novosibirsk and Petrozavodsk and all the places. And then we had to just, you know, like, freeze it. Some of them I had to cancel, of course. Yeah. And of, were you, I were regret you very it. sad about this? this of course. Issue? I mean, of, then I realized now that, I mean, what the hell? Like, my parents are, you know, my, my parents are there, they're alive, they're healthy, thank God, they're healthy. And to cancel performances at the place where my parents live, like, I'm sorry, this is a stupid decision. So I was very stupid, of course. I wanted to ask if you know that there is a Dimitri Smirnov composer. There are two. There are two? Yes. I, fo I found who was, who was born in, who, in Minsk. 
Yeah. And he died in England. If yes. You, if you know about him. It's a wonderful composer. Music. Yeah, I I checked some some things, some pieces of him and. Yeah, Patrice Kaczynska recorded. Ah, really? S- yes, there she recorded a CD, the introduction yeah. to to this composer. She did a wonderful CD. I heard his uh, symphonic pieces back home. His wife is composer. Elena Firsova and she composed a lot of stuff and she even composed a fantasia for violin that I once you t- tried to play yeah. it's difficult piece. and her their daughter is Alisa Firsova she's a pianist and composer too and another composer with the same name is a choir composer and he is from St. Petersburg oh. too nice. and my mother was his student and she, nice. amazing yes and he's a wonderful composer also he can uh, mostly composed for choir. If you were not a violinist, what would you do? That's funny. We, <laughs> um, we had, with my wife, we had, uh, like a few days ago, we had this discussion and we wrote on little papers. Um, pilot. Pilot for... for Whatever. I like to... Bigger planes, uh, Yeah. I, like, I just I enjoy flying. I enjoy yeah. planes a lot. Viola player, <laughs> but I'm already a little bit of a viola player. <laughs> Thank you very much for this. Thank you. And, uh, it was fun. Thank you. Thank you, man. Where can we hear you next time? Um, play with Sangalen, Symphony Orchestra yeah. Sangalen. What will you play? December 15th and 17th. We play a program. Composition of Mozart, Corelli, uh-huh. uh, and Haydn. Yeah. Nice. And I will also conduct. Really? <laughs> well, I'll try. I'll I try. Think. I'll try to do something good. Great. Good luck and. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.